Good morning, everybody. It is October 3rd. I'm Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Most, and welcome to the Victoria Real Estate Show with... Hello, everyone. Andrew Plank here with uh, Royal LePage and uh, Vibe Real Estate Group. It's good to be here. And... Hello, mortgage broker with the DLC Modern Mortgage Group. Hello. Hello, All everyone. Right. So how has your week been? Uh, Go ahead, Jen. I'll take it after. <laughs> it's um, busy. Definitely gotten busier. Um, lots of inquiries um, and um, yeah, more more activity, which is great. Nice. Good. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I've been um, back and forth from Vancouver for some personal reasons, but we are finding uh, it's really, really busy. Um, have certainly seen an uptick in our buyer activity. Um, listings have been uh, a mix, but it's been it's been definitely a busy time. We got uh, we listed a townhouse, a beautiful townhouse, and got an offer right away. I think I announced it last week, mm -hmm. so um, it was unconditional. The offer, the um, conditions come off today. It's recession, and mm -hmm. then um, I got. A, a lot of money off for a client on another a purchase of another town home so um that has been on the market for a while so that was good so things mm -hmm. are going well yeah 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 we're i think we're in a bit of a mixed time where there's going to be some great opportunities for buyers and sellers uh who who price properly are going to be sold quite well um but it's so sensitive so it is yeah 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 Pricing is so important. Pricing okay. is important. So we are talking the stats today, right? We've got um, the September stats to go through because we are yeah. only in October 3rd. Yes, super fun. Let's talk numbers. I love okay. It. So first of all, if you like the show, please click on the like. We really actually need that in order to stream this program. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our program. And if you're on YouTube, follow us there. And comment if you have any questions. We love to hear what you have to say. So let us know. Alrighty, here we go, Andrew. This is from September of 2024 and October of 2024. So months to date right. on each. Months to date. Okay. So oh, so we've done months to date. Oh, okay. This last is, seven days this, on each. I uh, yeah, I'm a little yeah. So we're doing here the last seven days, uh, October third. It is so last seven days before October third. We had 251 new properties go live on the MLS. 143 properties from the pool of available properties went pending, and 142 properties from the pool of available properties were uh, decreased in price. The sellers were adjusting price. Seven price increases. Two properties came back to market. 256 transacted at uh, land title office 164 expired listings out of that pool of properties and two were withdrawn so from the week before i guess i'll just take that um there were 209 pardon me at the beginning of september so beginning of september we had uh 296 new listings going live a little bit more than we had in the last week 101 properties go pending, um, certainly less than we had in the last week. We had 98 price decreases, uh, definitely less again than we just recently had. One increase, five back on market, 288 transacted at land title. 161 expired, that's kind of a wash between the two, in nine withdrawn. So this is interesting to me because if you look at the list to sale ratio, we have less mm -hmm. coming on and more selling and this this correlates with our kind of fall market, right? Our little bump happening here. Whoops. That's, ex that's exactly Andrew. what I was what I noticed. The mm -hmm. sold the sold of two fifty six versus the new listings of two fifty one. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's good for sellers. All right. So in the month end statistics, October first, twenty twenty four. Uh, for the month of September, sorry, we have 571 net unconditional sales happening in September 2024 compared to 493 in September 2023. That's interesting. So, up mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yep. 
Um, yeah. And we're just up from August of 2024 at 545. New listings uh, total for the month of September were 1,441. That's compared to 1,297 for September of last year. So up again overall. And uh, from last month, we were at 1,043. So interesting. So again, listings coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, active listings total 3,361. That's up from September of 2023, 2699. And it is just a little bit up from August, about 200 more than yeah. we were last month. So yeah. Uh -huh. We're building up an inventory here, folks. That's a good thing. It is. I've got some. I've I've been hearing some interesting takes on this in the last uh, little while, and we'll I'll, I'll bring that up when we go into the stats. But um, there's an interesting way to look at all this as we go into the new year. Just get into, into it me. now. Come you on. You want me to get into it now? Okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll. I just was trying to build up a little bit of uh, tension here. So you know we've had a lot of listings coming on live, and you so when you go back to those stats, you see that there are a lot of listings that do get withdrawn or expired. Not all of those get relisted because some people are saying, "Let's wait till the spring. The spring market's going to be better. The spring market's going to be better." We have a pool of buyers out there that have also been waiting to get into the market as we've been waiting for the um, interest rates to come down. We also have some of these announcements from the federal government with the new CMHC. Um, uh, limit raised to 1.5 million. Um, what we're going to see here, what the anticipation is, is, um, oh, and by the way, too, the last month stats, um, normally we see sales go down month over month between uh, September, sorry, uh, August, September, or anyway, the stat, we're seeing better numbers than we're anticipated given what we, we normally would see in um, in September stats. So we're seeing buyers coming back to the table. We're seeing a pool of inventory that is growing, but also um, we'll see more inventory coming in the fall, in the spring, but we also have buyers coming for that too. So it's kind of an interesting uh, 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 environment. What I'm finding is I'm getting calls on listings that I expired earlier in the year. So there are people who were looking earlier who have now decided they want to get into the market. So yeah. they're calling up and calling the expired, to see if they can get in without any competition. And what I'm telling yeah. my clients is, you know what, it might be better to wait until September or until the new year. Uh, if you want to, like if you're in the core, because you're going to have more people looking at that uh, time. That being said, if you are having trouble getting your place sold, the list to sale ratio is going to go down. Um, sorry, the number of listings is going to go down. And then the list to sale ratio will get really good in December. So if you're having trouble selling your place, wait it out stay on the market um and i you, i know you shook your head there but um i'm talking specifically about properties outside the core okay so yeah i mean i don't disagree that when there's less inventory and not everybody calls up about expired listings that's a great strategy by the way and um if you're not finding what you're looking for on the market right now when we have really high inventory um, there is still that inventory that we're seeing coming up and expiring and not being relisted. So um, of those expiries, we do see quite a few of those do relist, but there's definitely ones that don't and it's worth going after. But yeah, no, December, I feel like, um, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my hopes and dreams on, well, if we're not getting a sale now, then we're definitely going to get something in December because in it, there will be less uh, competition. That's not a strategy I would um I would pursue, but good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. And I just want to say, um, realtors, be very careful about approaching expired listings. Uh, you should go through the agent only because uh, people file these privacy of information forms and they can click off that they do not want to be contacted by a realtor. And so if you're doing that, you're you should really check with the realtor, the listing realtor first, 
before going I mean, to an next Sorry. On top of that, it's just it's just good form, and it actually works better in your favor because number one, you can't you can't uh, straddle both sides of a transaction anyway. We we can only represent one party. We want to represent the buyer in that case. So just call the listing agent. They've got a relationship. They have the contact information for these people. They understand their needs, and motivations, and they can work on your behalf. They want to get paid, um, and so help help them help you. Just um, it happens. It's it's actually I always. So going back a step, you're getting more of those calls, Jane. That's a really good indicator that there's a pool of buyers out there that are coming to the table and are looking for things. And I, I think things are price sensitive. There's a lot of overpriced property on the market right now, given where the actual values are. But there are buyers willing to buy and the market will pick them up as once sellers kind of adjust to that. Yeah. So I'm I'm... I am contacting the sellers to see if they do want to sell, and um, mm -hmm. and in some cases they don't. Now they're just they're happy. In one case, you know, staying where they were meant they were doing some work on their house, and then they got all excited about their house again. So there you mm -hmm. go. Yeah, fair enough. All right, Jen, how is it going with uh, the um, financing side of the bank? It's been okay. kind of a boring week. Nothing too exciting. We've had so many good announcements in the last few weeks, having three positive changes. Um, what, I mean, our current rates right now for an insured um, high ratio purchase, we've got a 4.29 for a five-year fix. And the variable currently I've got is about 5.44. Um, wow. Yeah, so what we're seeing, I mean, the projection right now is that um, the Bank of Canada could drop the overnight lending rate by half a percent, um, which um, would be really nice. Um, that meeting is coming up on October 23rd. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. How come we all know that before it happened? <laughs> because... We, we don't know. And there's lots of stats that go into that final decision. But what we do do is we follow what happens. And I'm not an economist by any means. Um, we follow um, what the U.S. feds do. And they, after not doing any drops, just dropped their uh, rate by half a percent. Yeah. So right. that's where our projections come out. And I follow a lot of economists and more economists are saying like they basically not bet on it, but, you know, hedge their bets on, oh, are they going to drop half a percent, quarter percent, you know, um, and that's the current from what I'm reading. That's the current projection. And when I see fixed rates lower than variable, that says to me that there is an anticipation that rates are going to go down on the variable rate side. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What do they well, what do they call that? Like an in, inverse yield. Inverted. What, what's, inverted, yeah, inverted yield curve. Okay. Inverted what? Sorry. Yield curve, and it's been this way now for a year and a bit. That's a long time for that. Yeah. 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 And and in in the past, what was it? An inverted e an inverted yield curve would um would indicate it, it generally had sort of a that prime rate's going to drop. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so generally you want to go with, you want to go with variable when you see the inverted rate uh, yield curve. Yeah. Correct. It also depends on how, I mean, right now there's a significant difference between that variable rate and the fixed. Mm -hmm. So on an individual basis from a comfort level, are they okay taking that added risk or do they want that guarantee of a fixed payment? So when right. when the fixed is here and the variables here, the, the what they're the bank is betting is that this is going to go here eventually, and so they want people to lock in. They want it to look attractive, so that the people who are going variable will commit to fixed and paying more mm -hmm. over the long run than yes. the variable. Because guess what? So then, oh, I'm opposite. So. so so now these people, all of a sudden they want, oh, we want to get out of our fixed rate. 
we want to go and relock in and the banks are really smart and you can't get out of it without paying a very significant penalty. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're thinking of moving in the next few years, don't go fix because it's going to cost you a lot of money. Yes. So very well, well. Yeah. Make sure that you look into um, how the interest rate differential penalty is calculated with your particular lender. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that a lot of people make decisions based on the what just the numbers say to them, but they don't and they don't take into account and communicate with the the bank or their lender what their actual future plans are, and it just makes such a big difference um, to your to to what you're going to be paying over time and what your decisions, your actual the possible possible actions you can take. I mean, if you're in a fixed mortgage that you can't um, move without big penalty. Um, you're going to, it's going to limit your ability to move and maybe take advantage of changes in the market as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. No variable. I'm not sure what's happening with Andrew, but he keeps popping in and out. Okay. Total active listings, Andrew, take it away. Uh, you know, I, uh, okay. This is like a ski hill here. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Pregnant person on their side? Uh, what? Um, okay, so what do you want me to say here? We've got a uh, total active listings has actually, you know, reached a peak um, back in uh, June, July of 2024, uh, a recent peak in the last couple of years, um, but then it's come down a little bit. What we generally see, um, is that these things go down to a low in December uh, and then start to, to build up again in spring. And so you can see that same pattern every year. Um, what's interesting here is that, you know, we had a drop uh, in the last couple of months in inventory, but then it's, it's spiked up again. And I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what comes in the coming months. What we really don't know yet is what our spring market will be. What we do know is we have high inventory but there's also um, an ecosystem that's looking like it's going to be really positive for buyers soon and so that inventory should start to go down as buyers pick up the properties and as sellers become more aligned in their pricing all right so looking at the total new mls listings and total mls sales the new listings are in the blocks here and as andrew was saying you can see the blocks go down in december that's just seasonal lows the list to sale ratios are really good. And uh, for a buyer, the best time to buy actually is in the fall when those list to sale ratios are much lower than they are elsewhere in the year. So there's opportunity here if you're a buyer to get into the market and likely anybody who's gonna be listed right now is gonna be very motivated. Um, May was a bump in the market, which is why I think we saw the total, if you look here, the total listings increased in June following a very uh, busy May. And so um, I found it was busy for me anyway. Anyway, mm. uh, generally sales peak in May, um, and that's just the way the market goes. We usually have a second peak in September, and I see it's happening this year. It didn't happen last year, though. So Yeah, and, and that's the thing is I'm feeling like we're going, we, we are in another active market right now um that that over the last couple of years we've stopped kind of expecting we usually talk about a, 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 a boost in this in september um and a lot of people don't really understand that when they when we talk i talk to people about the the annual um uh, the annual rhythm spring is the best time for market but then after that comes fall after that i would say and i'd love to hear your opinion after that i would say is summer uh and then winter is the slowest time of year yeah i would say like from i remember going away in december and thinking oh, i hope I hope nobody wants to buy i hope nobody wanted to buy in fact yeah. i put on a new listing and there was no activity and then i came back in january and i said because the sellers were like they were looking at the list to sale ratio there they would just come on the market we were in downtown victoria and no activity but uh, we relisted in January and we just took off, sold right yeah. away. So you yeah. do you can't force the issue sometimes. Um, just remember that, you know, like it's like doing an open house on the long weekend. I got a call from an agent the other day. 
you got any open houses you want done? And I'm like, you know what? Spend your time with buyers right now because everybody's away and you can get some good deals on long weekends because you don't have as much competition. Sad, but true. Interesting. Anyway. A long weekend is the same as summer and winter. It's just people are distracted. They're doing other things and um, realtors don't want to work. So you can take advantage of that. Yeah. I remember helping a client buy a house during a snowstorm. They listed it. The snowstorm hit. It was right at the yeah. top of, uh, I think, near where you live. And um, I remember doing fishtails going up the the Montrose when I get to yeah. the house. Oh, no. I wrote, we wrote the offer that night and the guy's like, nobody else is interested <laughs> just because nobody yeah. else is driving in the snow. <laughs> That's right. But you know, it's so subjective for, um, for a seller when they've been listed in one of those times or they listed just before the long weekend and over the long weekend, there wasn't the activity it could have had, um, or during the summer, there wasn't the activity or in the Christmas time. So it, it, subjectively they feel like, oh, nobody wants, nobody wants me. <laughs> Nobody wants what I am offering. And so I have to work with whatever comes my way. Um, and then that turns on a dime when you're in a different market. Yeah. And you know, we can, I find that sellers can get sassy when it's a seller's market and buyers yes. can get sassy when it's a buyer's market. And, you yes. know, like just treat each other with respect. Oh, people. Cool, cool your jets, folks. And sometimes uh, that sassy will work against you. I mean, buyers, I've seen buyers where they think, oh, it's a it's a buyer's market and I can get anything I want. And then they're passing up such amazing properties and then they're being jerks when entering negotiation. Uh, and same with sellers when it's it's a seller's market. And it's like, you know what? These things are seasonal. They come and go. Everything evens out. And, there, you know, karma comes into play here sometimes too. Like, uh, you know, let's, 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 Let's do this. Uh, let's do this professionally. But yeah, uh, it can work against you when you think. Well, for example, in those high markets where it's a seller's market, and sellers are like, "No, I'm not going to take any offer because none of them are high enough." <laughs> this is the best market you're ever going to get, folks. And you're not working with the buyers who offered you a hundred thousand above asking because you think it's worth more. Mm, that's not really going to. That, that's an extreme example, but. I had a listing once where a seller, um, we got one offer on their property. It was right at the end of the busy market. I think it was like May of 2022. And um, we got a full price offer and she countered higher. And I was like, uh, this is a good offer. <laughs> Go with the offer. <laughs> what was but, the end result? Did it, did it still come to terms? Well, the agent asked me, you know, why are you countering higher? And so I said to the seller, how do you want to answer that question? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I just expected the market to come back with multiples, but we, um, because we had to spend time getting their property ready, we missed the market. So sometimes you just got to get on. Sometimes more action is better. Like just take the action, go anyway. Yeah. Say okay, well, say the market is very challenging too. Pardon? You know, in the market, like try, you, you know, when you try in time. Yeah, you take your you take your boat out and you start uh, going against the tide. Um, you, you know, you're not going to be. You, you spend that extra time to get your boat ready to go, and then you go out against the tide. You're not getting to your destination, right? And as long as your boat's overall ready to go get in there and, and let the tide carry you. And that's the thing people don't understand the seasonality of these markets and listening to their agent and stop waiting until you've thinking. got, stop waiting until you've got the exact right paint color and the exact right furniture configuration and, the, and, and that garden bed completely done and ready. And you've gotten, now you're in summertime and you've missed your spring market. And your garden's yeah. gonna die. <laughs> and your garden's gonna die and it's not gonna look good. Yeah. Stop it. Just stop it, folks. Okay. One funny story I'm just going to say. So I have agents from other cities who watch real estate in Victoria, obviously, and I show my listing and they're like, the grass is dead. 
<laughs> I said, yeah, everybody's grass is dead in the summer. <laughs> but they're used to seeing, I guess, the the pictures all used up or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you go to Toronto, the grass is green because it rains a lot in the summer. And in Victoria, yeah. it's very dry. But anyway. Okay. And people people are careful about uh, the environment and watering and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's a whole other mix. Yeah. Okay, so we're here on list to sale ratio. So we did have a peak in May of 2023. I just want to point out that during COVID um, in 2021, September, October, November, there were 800 listings and 800 sales. And then in March of 2022, we were at uh, for every 100 listings, we had 120 sales. So our inventory was really low. And this is, it's kind of like when you're walking along an escalator and then the escalator stops and you just start walking regularly. We are in a regular market here and it feels slow to realtors. It feels like, oh my God, why can't we get this house sold already? The, the yeah. fact is we're in a balanced market so for every five listings, four are selling now. I mean, one is selling. One is selling. Four are not selling. So our ratio is 20%. And we just got to take it easy. It's going to take, this means it's, we have a, uh, what's it called? Absorption yeah, this, rate of about five months. This hmm? this is, um, what, I want to just correct or, or like, um, so what you said is, one in five listings are selling. That's not, it's not that if you are one of five listings, um, your chance of selling is one in five. Your chance of selling that month is one in five. This is the absorption per month of listings relative to the actual amount of listings on market. So if you have a hundred listings on market at, at one time, in this case, 20% are selling. So 20 are gonna sell that month. And if you're on market for, it will take you five months before, if there were no other properties coming on market for all of the inventory to be used up. But the problem is there's always more pulling into the market as well. So um, you can't just say, oh, my place will sell within five months because it's a 20% thing. But yeah, I just wanna correct that because it sounds like you were saying, and I know that's not what you meant. You have a one in chance, five chance of selling and one in five listings are selling. It's, it's, not, it's not that number. It's not going to sell quickly is what I mean, is that it's going to yeah. take longer. The average days on market is longer. We see that um, every month. And looking here, you can see like the total active listings here and the sales as a stripe is that we're seeing a bigger change between the line and the top of the uh, blocks there. So that's why we're seeing a list to sale ratio of 20%. And we are not in a buyer's market, folks. So as Jane said, it's a balanced market. To get down below that 20%, maybe closer to 15, we might get into a buyer's market. But you can see even in, our, you know, in 2023, um, I wouldn't say we were in a buyer's market either. We haven't really been in a, um, I mean, we've been in a, in a more balanced market for sure. And it's been much better for buyers than it's been in a long time. Um, yeah. I don't know that we're going to get back to a buyer's market here for in, in any time soon, given what we're starting to see with interest rates and moving towards spring. So yeah, don't get okay. cocky, kid. Oops. Don't get cocky. I was just thinking that. Okay, so single family homes. Uh, Andrew, you want to take this? Um, again, it's a graph with a bunch of ups and downs. <laughs> we've we've had. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we've had the last couple months going down of um, single family homes pricing, average pricing. So, um, you know, we reached a peak in 2023 uh, in the last recent last couple of years. I'd say we had a higher peak um, back in 2022, 2021. But currently, um, average price looks like it's what that's around uh, 1.2 and change. Yeah. And um, as we, I think we're going to see though, with these new CMHC rate uh, changes coming where you can go above a million, Jen's nodding her head. I think we're going to see this, this turn around yeah. um, because there was a cap at a million and that there was like a no man's, no person's land between a, a million and 1.2 where people were 
um, having to price lower than a million in order to get the buyers. And that's, that's now been removed, that artificial cap on pricing. Well, in December, it will be removed, right? Yes, yes. So, yeah. like, uh, I believe the peak during COVID was around 1.4 or something like that. And what we're seeing here is we're settling around 1.2. And I mm. do agree with you that what will happen is the lower end of the market will come up now that that CMHC cap is going up to 1.5. So I, I do think that we're going to see more houses being priced over a million now, unfortunately, yeah. for buyers. I mean, they're saying they're making housing more affordable. I don't think they are. But anyway, this happened, uh, this happened a few times as we've been in real estate, Andrew and I, in almost 20 years. Um, and what happens is then that we just see a bump in the market. Okay, yeah. condos, I'll just do this for you. So <laughs> we were at around 625 in September of 2022. Uh, and then in September 2023, we were around 650 and we're back around 600. So just as like I would say a slow uh, release yeah. of pressure on the condo market. A lot of this is because there have been um, short-term rental condos that have come back on the market. Generally, there are large one bedrooms and they've been bringing the average price of condos down. Um, and there's been a glut of condos downtown. But I expect, mm -hmm. um, and I was just listening to Benjamin Tall, he was saying that, that uh, overall in Canada, high rise condos are not doing that great, which was interesting to me. I never really looked at the differentiation between the two. Um, mm. but, uh, well, the, the strata, a good time to buy. strata fees in the high rises have been going up a lot because of insurance issues and, um, concerns around piping and, and remediations and so forth in some of these older buildings. So, um, so the high rises are actually, it's funny because steel and concrete high rise has been the baby of a lot of people. Would, it was the, what people were looking for in um, a good investment in a condo. And it's kind of turning around a little bit because people are concerned about those water leaks on the 20th floor that go down through 10 floors of, of condos and doing so much destruction um, and everyone with their cheaper wooden, <laughs> it's just, it does a lot of damage. But so when we look at this stat, it's pretty stable for the last number of months. It's really not been um, a lot of movement. Um, and that's the thing. The condo market has been not super exciting. It's just not been a lot of movement. It's been not stale, but not active. Right. And my my thought is it's a good time to get into the market because it's not active. So this is a good yes. time to get to take advantage of an opportunity if you're looking for a rental. All right, townhomes. We always talk about the range and fluctuation of pricing here because there aren't, relatively speaking, as many townhomes as there are condos and homes. Um, but mm -hmm. we are seeing relatively flat market again. So two years ago, we were at 800. We did some dips, um, but we seem to be hovering around between... 825 and 850, I would say, over the past six yeah. months. You know, this is interesting if you want to look at this um, just from one perspective. We, we talk about that that winter market. And the winter market, you know, based on this graph, really looks like it affects townhouses more strongly than anything else. And um, we do know that, you know, of the inventory out there, townhouses is a much smaller segment. So any shift in... Um, uh, the number of sales and the values is, is just impact, it impacts this graph a lot more strongly. But overall, it's been really flat other than those dips uh, in winter. So, I mean, if, if you did want to take that uh, literally, it might mean that it might be a good time to look at townhouses in the dead of winter for a deal. Right. And so a lot of people go for townhouses because they present upfront as being less cost, but they do have usually fairly high strata fees because you're paying for your building insurance as well as your common property maintenance and comparatively to a condo there's going to be more maintenance for things like property and stuff like that so uh, you know you're let's say you buy a house at a million 
and a condo at 800,000 and, or sorry, a townhouse at 800 and a condo at 500, your strata fees are going to add to your monthly debt ratio, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like if, what is, what is the impact of those strata fees? So let's say I noticed that they're starting to increase. I just sold one, a townhouse recently. Strata fees were 600. So how much are people carrying? Like, is it like 200, $300,000 if they're paying $600 a month in a strata fee? Mm, you know what I, I mean? Don't, I don't, well, from a qualifying standpoint for your mortgage, and I don't understand why, but I'm not complaining. We only have to consider half of the strata fee. Whatever the strata fee is, from a qualifying standpoint, we use half of that. You know, um, you don't, what I find, I've always found this fascinating because if you, if I was to buy a townhouse um, uh, and pay strata fees for the townhouse, then I'm not, I'm not paying and saving up for a new roof and new exterior cladding and new windows and all of that stuff because it's taken care of by the strata. I'm not bringing in, uh, I'm not doing gardening and yard maintenance either because the strata generally takes care of that in most stratas. So, um, when you buy a house, all of those extra costs are on you and you should be putting that money aside. So I, I see a lot of buyers go, oh, I, I, I don't wanna buy a townhouse because it's got such, it's got high strata fees. You don't understand, you buy a house, you're gonna be putting money aside for this too. You're gonna be paying for this one way or another. People who own a townhouse complex aren't stupid. They don't wanna spend money, they don't have to. And it's there's an efficiency in having a group of people together in this. So I find it funny that the lenders um, I, I think it makes sense the lenders would only look at half and not the full because otherwise they want to also look at just home ownership in general right. as a cost. Yeah. Hmm. No, like lawn makes... maintenance, maybe $400 a, a month if you yeah. have a yeah. big lawn. Yeah. yeah. But there is, townhouses are that sort of middle ground where condos are much more efficient. There's a lot less, I'd say, exterior surface area that you're maintaining. Um, whereas a, a townhouse, each townhouse is often some, some townhouses are standalone and there's a lot more, um, requirement for upgrade and there's a lot more land to maintain. Uh, so you're not just a, a multi-story building on a small plot of land. So it is from a cost perspective, townhouses are the more expensive way of going about it, but a single family home you do have the choice of whether or not you put a new roof on or wait an extra couple of years, but you also have the choice or run the risk of having a roof leak. It also depends on who's on the strata and what the bent is of the strata. Cause sometimes people don't want to do any maintenance. And other times um, you have somebody who like in um, Shoal Point where they're very, very proactive and they have like a $3 yeah. million dollar contingency and replace everything rather than just focus on yeah. repair. I, I heard a, an interesting um, take on this once and I found it, I, I like to use this is when you go through a strata building, look at the cars in the parkade and you'll get a sense of who the people are that live there and also how they care about that strata. I mean, you're gonna read through all the documents and everything else, but if you use the car analogy a little further, you know, a strata, maintaining a strata is like maintaining a car. You could have an old car that you're always outside washing it and making sure it's super clean and changing the oil and um, you know low drive but you're putting up let's or, and or you're 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 buying something and you're supercharging it and always putting a lot of money into it because you you want to just have it super uh, up, up tip top shape is that money well spent maybe maybe not but that's your choice but a group of owners in a building will sometimes make those similar decisions. And some will just let it run and, and let the oil get old and and not not take care of it. I just want to say I it's interesting you made that comment because I tell clients when you're looking at a neighborhood, you want to look at the exterior of other people's homes and specifically the roofs, and you want to see how they're maintaining their roof. Because if people are spending money on the roof, which is one of the biggest capital costs. And you know that the neighborhood is a good neighborhood and they're caring for their properties. But if you see those old T-lock roofs with tons of um, moss and it looks like it's all curling and stuff, that tells you a lot about 
how your neighbors are maintaining their home and you have to make a decision if you want you know what kind of neighbor do you care about that or not it's up to the buyer right it's like but it well, is something to observe a lot of people want a new roof but they can't afford it um so it's you know and that's where strata you're kind of forced into that if majority of people choose to to put a new roof on but when you do have a bunch of people living in a strata that actually are pensioners they bought in 40 years ago into a 1980 built place and they're they don't want to be putting any more money into the place it owes them nothing and they have nothing to put into it so it just starts to fall apart the same with you're making that analogy around a neighborhood and that's true you've got people who bought in at one point had great you know hopes and dreams for their homes but maybe no longer have the time energy or money to keep it up and it is an important thing to note it's well for them what i was saying i said it yesterday actually i'm like these may be people who may want to sell who uh, may be motivated to move out of their home because they don't want to spend any more money on maintenance and so like if you're looking for opportunities in the neighborhood those are maybe people that we approach rather than the recently renovated home those people are going to want a top dollar so what we're yeah. trying to do is try and find a home off market right yeah. and they, they want a very yeah. specific neighborhood i would say to use that you know driving down the neighborhood and looking at the roofs and everything else that's that's an indication too that the the neighborhood is gentrifying and um, there might be room uh, for people to come in and buy them up and fix them up over time because people are probably um, will be moving out of that neighborhood soon. But um, so that doesn't bode well for your future value in the short term. Um, but in the long term, it could mean that the neighborhood you want to watch that and get a sense of is this an improving neighborhood or is this a neighborhood that's going into decay? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah okay um do we want to do this i know you guys don't like this i love it but <laughs> well we're, we're coming up on uh 45 minutes so um okay. we want to hit high points and then yeah okay basically what we're seeing change from last month is we're down a little bit on in all areas of the city from 0.4 to 0.9 percent in terms of benchmark pricing and we are down about two to three percent change over last year. Condo markets were about even from last month, and we're down three to five percent from last year. And then uh, row townhomes were about even from last year, and down five percent in the peninsula. So how's that for hmm. really making it? That was that was to the point. To the point. To the point. So, um, okay, so I guess we'll see you guys in a week. Um, we have uh, anything we want to talk about upcoming listings. I can talk about a couple. Um, oh, no, I can't because uh, we have to be careful and I don't have it anything uh, that I, is within the next three days. But I've got some generally. I, can I just say generally? Help me out, guys. Where are we at? Uh, it's up to you. Yeah. I'm not no, going to get in trouble. I'm going to tease that I've got a I've got a, a a West Shore townhouse coming up at some point soon, and a single family home in the core uh, with a one bedroom suite coming up soon. Um, price points I will hold on speaking about, but they're going to be reasonable. And um, more information hopefully in the next week or two. Okay. That All right. Good. I'm going to announce mine next week. <laughs> All right, you guys, and just so you realtors know, uh, the is, Korea is looking at everybody's pages and making sure that you are abiding by how you are advertising yourself. So if you're working with a brokerage, make sure the brokerage name is in your real estate name on your all your social media, as well as your if you're in a team, what your team name is. So little tip for you realtors. All right, we are on every... Friday at uh, 9 30. Thursday. So Thursday. 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 Thank you. Thursday at 9 30. Andrew. Andrew, how do we reach you? Uh, you can reach me, um, phone me or text 250 360 6106. Email is info at andrewplank.com. That's my name, andrewplank.com. And um, 
The website has lots of useful information, andrewplank.com. Instagram is Plank Andrew. So come check it out. Shane hey, Jen. and Jen. Jen. I am at 250-217-4925. Um, email is jen at jenlo.ca and website jenlo.ca. Awesome. And I'm Jane Johnston. I'm with the Briar Hill Group. My number is 250-744-0775. You can reach me at briarhillgroup at gmail.com. And please visit our website at briarhillgroup.com. Don't forget to watch these shows and more at victoriarealestateshow.com. And follow me on social media at realtyteacher underscore remax underscore victoria or at Briar Hill Group. Um, and under the first one, you can see me do a hand stamp. So exciting. <laughs> Hey, folks, and right. I just want to say um, thanks for tuning in. And, you know, it's been interesting. It's come to my attention. A lot of folks um, aren't necessarily watching this live, but they're listening to this on podcasts and so forth. So we do have an audience out there that's, um, you know, driving in their cars or, or, you know, doing their going about their daily things and just listening to us in the background. So we're so honored by that. And thank you for being there. And uh, always reach out if you have questions. And if you have ideas for topics, please let us know. Agreed. Yeah, I hear about that a lot. A lot of people watch us after the show. So enjoy and uh, send us your questions. We'll answer them. Bye, you guys. Have a great week. Have a great uh -huh. week, guys.